It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 357 of Science on Top for Monday the 20th of April 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. And you can listen to this show because good people have signed up on Patreon to donate to each episode. You just go to scienceontop.com slash donate to play your part. You only get charged when we release an episode and you can put a limit on how much you donate per month. We're very grateful to everyone who has done that. And now let's begin with a look at quarantine sex. With a lot of the world in lockdown, there are some people looking at their housemates with a fresh set of eyes. And Penny, there's been some unexpected hanky-panky happening in a Hong Kong zoo recently, hasn't there? That is not the intro I was expecting. Uh, No, but it's the intro we needed. This is actually a story about pandas. Yeah, obviously. (laughs) Yes, I guess lockdown has been going better for these pandas than it has for a lot of people. Um, They have been trying to successfully mate since 2010, however. Actually, I don't think they've been trying to mate since then. I think the zookeepers have wanted them to mate since then. (laughs) I think the zoo has been wanting them to mate since 2010. Apparently, panda mating is actually really a difficult thing. So the female panda only um, ovulates about once a year and it can be quite difficult for the male to actually mount her. It makes it very hard for them to breed naturally. So most zoos do um, artificial insemination, but it hasn't got as good a chance of the pregnancy taking and surviving as it does if they do mate naturally. So these two pandas, uh, Ying Ying and Lily at Ocean Park in Hong Kong, took advantage of the privacy offered by lockdown and successfully mated. This could be really great news. Panda pregnancies take 10 months. It'll be a while before it's known whether or not there's a baby because they can only be detected by ultrasound less than three weeks before they're born. So watch this space, I guess, for almost a year. We won't know until then (laughs) if there is going to be a baby panda. Sorry, did you say they can only be detected... Three weeks before they're born. Yeah, three weeks before they're born. And how long is gestation period? Ten months. So are they like wombats? They come up tiny little things and... Yeah, that's humans just... can be detected. But it's a couple of weeks after the pregnancy's actually started. Yeah, so pandas are just a very difficult kind of species. I guess maybe their young is very small and they're very big animals and they're probably not really cooperative with transvaginal ultrasounds and everything. It could be difficult to do a panda pregnancy test. But anyway, it's really interesting because, I mean, I, I do think of zoos during coronavirus because they've all been locked down. There's no people coming in but all the zookeepers have to keep working caring for the animals going on with their mission of you know breeding programs conservation and so on so i wonder if it's caused by the the change in environment the fewer people or if it's just coincidence they got some privacy and got it on (laughs) yeah but i have to say this is one of the few coronavirus related stories i'm very happy to talk about they haven't made a lot of good news stories with it no there hasn't been yeah, it's just weird that they've decided this is it. But and but also that this is the year that they've done it. I mean, obviously, it's that 24 to 72 hours where the female is up for it per year. And that's happened for the last nine years, but it, it's only been now that they've really got it on. They just don't like an audience, I guess. Um, some studies show they need to be attracted to each other to breed. So maybe it was a bit of a slow burn. Maybe they've only just now got through everything available on Netflix and this was the only <laughs> time they <were> like... <laughs> I should say when they had the privacy and they maybe they didn't want an audience, they obviously did have the zookeepers and there were there's, there's footage, there's video and uh, still footage of the act just in case people want that sort of documentation. Panda porn. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you say panda porn, but that is actually, they've tried that in the past to try and, I don't know, remind pandas on how it's done. They'll show footage of other pandas getting it on like remember this bit goes there and i think the pandas just look at it and go why are you doing this why are you showing me this so yes as you say penny some good news now let's take a break from the steamy topic of panda sex and have a look 
instead to the edge of our solar system. And we've talked on the show before, Lucas, about moons like Enceladus around Saturn and Ganymede around Jupiter that may have liquid oceans beneath their surfaces. And now we may be able to add Pluto to that list, right? Yeah, so it's a little bit like the Oprah thing of you get an ocean and you get an ocean, everyone gets an ocean. <laughs> it's kind of getting to that point that it seems that everything that has a surface in our solar system, it may be even including Mars, de definitely not Mercury, it seems to be, you know, potential place for a, a subsurface ocean. So we know, uh, for example, that most of the, well, certainly the Galilean moons of Jupiter all seem to have subsurface oceans, whether they're, they're kind of like, do you remember the slushy moon uh, episode that we had where Dr. Manar Casely spoke about, you know, the, the status of uh, Ganymede? It was described as a club sandwich or something. Something like that. There's certainly other moons within the solar system, like Enceladus springs to mind, which is one of the ice moons of Saturn, which in fact is the one that is believed to fuel the E-ring, one of the rings of Saturn, just from its uh, its, its spewing out of, of uh, water ice from, from a fissure in its south pole. So, and of course, there's, the, there's Europa itself, which we believe has a, a liquid ocean under its ice surface. Well, this new uh, study has had a look at some of the New Horizons data from um, obviously New Horizons a few years ago, went out, took photos on its approach to Pluto and then swung around and took photos as it left the other side of Pluto. And these particular images were actually from the far side of Pluto, not the approach side, which is where we, we got to see the, you know, the heart shape, shape that was... Uh, quite iconic at the time and really cute little graphics that people had put sort of Pluto the dog from Disney, you know, with it, with its heart beating and stuff like that. It was very cool. That's, that area is the Sputnik uh, Planitia, which is uh, basically an impact crater um, or an impact site on, on Pluto. As New Horizons left Pluto and spun around and was taking images from the other side, they found some terrain which included all of these ripples on the surface, which, as it happens, are their opposite, the impact crater of that heart-shaped area of the Sputnik Planitia. So it certainly is indicative that if you recall, we've, we've spoken about Mercury in the past where there's a really cool formation on Mercury directly opposite a massive impact crater on the other side of, of Mercury. So there's a scenario in which if there's a hard enough impact in a spherical body, then the impact causes you know massive waves of energy to go around the planet and meet up on the opposite side from the impact. And those waves of energy, you know, even though it's a solid mass, those waves of energy do cause like ripples. And then on the other side, you've, you've actually got like a tower on Mercury with a, a big crater around it, directly opposite the, the impact crater. So that's what they actually think has happened here. They think that there's been an impact that's caused uh, that feature, you know, that heart shape on the approach side of, of Pluto from New Horizons. And then it's got this weird rippling on the surface of Pluto on the other side, uh, directly opposite the impact crater. And the rippling can really only be explained in computer models by the existence of a subsurface ocean, which is really interesting. Now, this isn't the first indication that there may be a subsurface ocean on Pluto. There's actually been previous uh, observations that have suggested that there might actually uh, have been or might may be a subsurface ocean. One of them is just the angle, rotational angle of, of Pluto. It's thought that same impact which caused that big you know, feature, that heart feature on, on that side, caused liquid water to flow for a very short period of time on the surface of Pluto. Uh -huh. And we can see, because basically we've got this very hard ice, you know, very flat ice section, which is also then covered in all of this other ejector material and what look like things that have come from Charon, which is one of Pluto's moons, which is almost as big as Pluto. And the, the two of them basically are shared materials. So Charon's very dark and it's got these, it, it looks like it's been hitting Pluto with a whole lot of material over, over the eons. And that seems to have settled on top of this planet year but the the feature itself looks like it has had liquid water on top and they think what that did was with the liquid water coming to the surface and then freezing very very quickly it basically tilted the angle of Pluto because suddenly it was out of whack in terms of its balance because the ice obviously has a lot of mass and where before it was subsurface suddenly now it's it's on the surface which means it's further away from the center of mass which then causes it to tilt on its axis which is which is kind of cool now just sorry um, when you say uh, liquid water are we actually talking H2O or is it more likely to be liquid methane or liquid nitrogen or something? 
Yes, it's actually H2O that they think. So actual liquid water flowed for you know a very brief period of time from this impact crater. Obviously, a huge amount of energy, huge amount of heat. Oh wow! You know, it, it allowed the water to become water. Now, of course, um, when you have a, a body with very very low atmospheric pressure, so so Pluto does have a very very thin atmosphere, but it's very very low pressure. Then you you tend to have water not being able to exist in its liquid state for for very long at all because it was going to go straight to straight to ice. Now, if there's no pressure whatsoever, it will tend to go straight from steam to ice. It even skips that liquid phase completely. We we do have a very slight atmosphere on Pluto, which is a part of what, what could have occurred there and why, why it allowed liquid water to flow for a very short time. Uh, but yeah, yeah, very cool. Basically, uh, you know, it's got the pressure of the terrain above it, because remember we're talking subsurface ocean, which is exactly why we have liquid stored under the surface of, for example, Ganymede, because the pressure of the terrain above it, it's that pressure that's required in order for the liquid to st- water to stay in its liquid form. Normally on Earth, it's the atmosphere that's providing the pressure. So yeah, the the indications certainly are. As I say, it's a lot is is based on the this this computer modelling that's just been completed. There there have been other signs in addition to this impact and the tilt of Pluto previously. So we've now basically got three quite interesting and, and certainly compelling lines of evidence that Pluto may have liquid water under its surface. And if that is the case, then it really quite significantly changes the way we need to view Kuiper Belt objects. So if you recall, Pluto is no longer a planet. It's a dwarf planet. It's a part of a classification of objects that are Kuiper Belt objects. These are mainly ice things, not all water ice. There's lots of other methane and uh, nitrogen and all sorts of other compounds that are that are in ice form in these Kuiper Belt objects. It certainly opens the possibilities that we have a lot more water that is actually potentially accessible with these objects. And that's pretty exciting as well. You know, when you consider if water can exist and it can exist in liquid form on these planets or and Kuiper Belt objects, then potentially that's one tick in the box, right? If you think of life, you've got liquid water. We, as you know, in our experience on Earth, liquid water is required for life. In addition, you need you need energy. So if there is any any heat uh, energy, particularly from radioactive decay on Pluto, that can also be from tidal forces, as we see on Europa and Ganymede and other. Galilean moons, tidal forces we think are a part of the equation for Enceladus as well, keeping its or at least part of its subsurface in liquid form. So if you've got heat or any other type of energy that's creating heat, you've got water, then potentially the only other thing you need is the right chemicals in place to to really have everything you need for life. It's yet another one of these tantalising things that perhaps there are many, many other chances within the very long time spans for, for life to get started because wow. we've got the pieces of the puzzle there. There's a lot to sort of take away from this, um, and I think it'll be really interesting. And again, uh, you know, I know we've done various episodes, and we did episodes at the time of, of New Horizons when it when it reached Pluto, but I think it's just so encouraging that a mission that's it's now, you know, a couple of years ago, its primary mission was finished up, but it's we're still going through the data from that very brief encounter with Pluto, because it didn't get into orbit, it didn't stop, it just flew past, and we're still, still getting this sort of rich data from from that encounter and it really you know to me it, it really shows how important these types of missions are yeah Definitely. Because if you remember, just before the encounter with Pluto, the, the best we had of that planet was just a, a murky, blurred little spherical image, and that was it. That's all we knew about it. It was blur, yeah. So that's just very cool. Very, very cool. It is. It's awesome. Yeah. We'll keep an eye on it to see what else turns up from all that data. Because I think it was like several months before all the data actually got back to Earth because it was so far away going at such a slow data rate. That's right. Yeah. And it took so much. That's right. Although, you know, it's, it's got to travel so far and, of course, it, it takes we're hours out there in terms of the speed of light. The good thing is with the antennas that are on New Horizon that there's not really going to be anything in the way. There's not going to be a mountain in the way or a tree. You know, it can keep on blasting to us. And certainly the Voyager probes are still sending data back to us. And they've, as we've reported multiple times, as they've crossed new boundaries and so forth of the solar system, they knew they had a lot of time to send the data back. Very interesting. Let's move on now and talk about food. Yum. And we've all noticed a big increase in soy products from tofu to veggie burgers to alleged cheese alternatives. The soybean is everywhere now. I knew you'd like that one, Penny. I love cheese. For those who may not be aware of this fact. Proper cheese. (laughs) Real cheese. 
But there are some concerns when it comes to the soy industry about the environmental impact that it can have, whether it's from the food miles, from transporting it from the particularly warm climates where it grows, or even the Franken food hysteria about genetically modified soy. But Pandy, could there be an alternative to soybeans on the horizon? Oh, I feel like no matter what you eat, it's a massive minefield. Sure. Like I don't think there's any way to say this is the one diet that walks lightly on the earth. But yeah, as Ed said, there are some issues with soy and the food miles, the genetic modification is something that causes a concern because then that means that there's a lot more Roundup being used, which there's also concerns when soy and corn are rotated in crops in that it depletes soils and you know has long-term effects on that farmland, that agricultural land. So, I mean, I think depending on anything is just not a great idea. And, you know, I always think about quinoa, how that became so popular and that caused massive social and environmental consequences in South America when all of a sudden it became more economic to export quinoa and then for people to have it as part of their traditional diet. So it's good to have lots of different protein sources. I mean, we've talked also about insect proteins in the past, which I personally have a bit of an ill kind of response to. I don't have that for fava beans. Fava beans are beans like that are able to be grown in different environments to soy. The study that I've read was from Denmark and they're able to be grown in Denmark. So that means you're really cutting down on the food miles and the transport of soy. But beans are not, you know, as high in protein and so on as other products. So one of the best ways of getting protein out of them was this method called wet fractionation. Fractionation is one of those things that comes up in all sorts of different sciences in different ways. So I remember learning about it in chemistry when you're thinking about hydrocarbons or all those petroleum, gas, oil, it means that you can separate them according to their weight. So if you've got something which is a mix of big molecules and little molecules or heavy molecules and light molecules, you can separate them off according to which ones are lighter and which ones are heavier. You can also do that for, for rocks. So this is like geology for me. Oh, you know how I didn't know where your intro was going? You didn't know this story was going to go into geology. But fractionation happens with rocks too. No one expects geology and yet it's always there. <laughs> So you get, you know, all the really heavy kind of mantle rocks. But like, I know that you're not going to believe me, but like a lot of the crust is made of rocks like granite, which is kind of one of the light and fluffy fractions of rock that floats up to the surface. So you've got your sort of heavier kind of really mafic rocks like gabbros, um, which are full of lots of iron and magnesium, whereas granite, even in colour, is lighter and so on. But you can also fractionate fava beans. So what you can do is use wet fractionation. You basically mill them into a flour, add water, blend it into a soup, and then you can sort out the products to get rid of, separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. So to get rid of the stuff you don't need and keep as much of the protein need as possible. Yeah, wow. And what's really promising about proteins produced from this method is that the protein is almost as readily digested as animal protein. So animal protein is really easily digested by most most people, caveat, caveat, because it's basically what we need. It is it is us. It's the same. For plant protein, you know, people, there's, it's often, plants are often lower in protein. They don't often have all the essential amino acids and so on. Yeah. So the fava bean protein is nutritious. It's produced quite nicely. Taste, it apparently when it's processed correctly, it retains a nice bright color, but it has a neutral taste and a good texture. And I'm not sure, like I haven't spent much of my life comparing different protein powders but they're not known for like they're not something I think people just drink because of their intrinsic deliciousness there's usually other reasons <laughs> no and they're, they're always artificially flavored and sweetened and things yeah yeah so I guess you know a neutral taste a good texture something that you can maybe fortify your food fortify different manufactured or processed foods with but that also is relatively low impact on the environment is really good and I think what else I liked thinking about this is you know I often think of soy as a great alternative to animal product but it really is that there isn't just one great alternative it's a matter of you know each area each group of people finding something that works for them so maybe fava beans 
a great in Denmark. Who knows what will be, you know, for Victoria or New Zealand. It could be a different kind of product. So, yeah. But also I think it's... it's This is fun and it was nice to think about, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also, it's one of those things where there isn't going to be the one silver bullet for everyone's miracle diet. It's going to be... No, no. Yeah, maybe you have some soybean products and some fava bean products mm. and maybe some meat yeah. or some other vegetables. You know, it's, it's a matter of a good variety in mixtures rather than... Oh, is it pronounced fava, not fava? I say fava beans. I've always called it fava beans. Oh, I always thought it was fava. Yeah, that's what Hannibal Lecter said as well. Just because I used to buy a product called flavour beans. Ah, uh, that's clever marketing perhaps. Maybe it is. Tomato, tomato. So, you know. Oh, well, there you go. Pardon my ignorance, everyone. Whatever. Well, Hann Hann Hannibal Lecter called them fava beans in Silence of the Lamb. Oh, see. Which he, he washed down the liver with a nice Chianti. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, but he said Chianti and not Chianti. <laughs> so, you know, can we really trust him? Well, that, that's why I don't know how to pronounce it because that movie. Yeah, yeah. Far too scary for me to watch. It's far too scary for me to even look at the poster. You know, with the moth. Yeah. I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Yeah. Puts the lotion on its skin. Or it gets the hose on. <laughs> Well, very cool. Like I said, uh, you want a mixture of lots of thing, different things and some diversity. Yeah. And whenever I, I read a study like this that says, you know, this food has got all these great advantages, I always wonder what's the catch? You know, what is it that in 10, 15 years time we're going to go, oh, but we've now stripped this whole area of its otherwise fertile growth or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, oh, I know. Everything has blowback. That's why I think diversity. Exactly. Diversity. And we don't want to be farming monocultures or anything, so. No. Well, that's it. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 357. And don't forget to go to scienceontop.com slash donate to contribute and help us make the show. Thanks a lot, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Here's some good news coming out of Hong Kong. A zoo which has been trying unsuccessfully to get its pandas to mate for 10 years, reported that finally, yesterday, the pandas spontaneously started having sex. And the researchers say they think it's because nobody is at the zoo. And I'm like, yeah, I don't need to be a researcher to know that that's what's happening. Of course, the pandas are having sex now that nobody's there. How do you think you would react if every day hundreds of people came to your bedroom window like, come on, have sex, do it. Come on, have sex, do it, do put it in. So I don't blame the pandas. I mean, like, even when I have one person watching me during sex, I'm like, hey, can you, can you look the other way? I'm, I'm just getting, yeah, I'm just real self-conscious, right? Would you mind looking, look the other way? It's, it's a lot of pressure. So. Good news for those pandas. Although the bad news is, now that nobody's watching, the monkeys have all stopped having sex. Yeah, those guys are freaks.